The window method of FIR filter design is fairly easy to understand and is actually an approach that one could use with pencil and paper to design filters by hand. In our derivation here, we're going to assume that the filter is linear phase, FIR filter, that the order is even, and so the frequency response can be expressed in terms of the m plus 1 samples of the impulse response as the sum from k equals 0 to m, hk, e to the minus jk omega. We're going to assume that that's linear phase, so it has phase factor e to the minus j omega m over 2, and then a real valued magnitude function what we're going to start off by doing is minimizing the mean squared error between our actual filter that we're trying to design that involves the coefficients h of k and some desired filter. So we'll integrate from minus pi to pi the magnitude squared of the error between our desired filter and our designed filter. We're going to assume that our desired filter is also a linear phase filter with the same group delay of m over 2 and consequently I can pull these phase factors out of the mean squared error expression and write it entirely as a difference between AD and A of omega magnitude squared integrated over minus pi to pi. We're going to assume that H of K plus M over 2, so that's a shift left corresponding to this phase factor, is equal to coefficients AK which has discrete time Fourier transform A of omega. So if I take a of omega and I take the inverse discrete time Fourier transform, I get the coefficients a k. So when I rewrite the mean squared error in terms of a of omega, I'm now going to be considering minimizing over the coefficients associated with this time shifted version of the impulse response. Parseval's theorem says that the integral of the magnitude squared in the frequency domain is equal to sum of the magnitude squared in the time domain. So I can write this problem as minimize over a k, the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of a d of k, and that would be the inverse discrete time Fourier transform of a d of omega, our desired real valued response, minus a of k magnitude squared. And the key here is that our actual response, because we're looking at a finite impulse response filter, these coefficients have to be only non-zero on an interval between minus m over 2 and plus m over 2 for k. So when I expand this error out in terms of different regions for k, I'm going to write the sum from k equals minus m over 2 to m over 2. That's the region over which the a k's can be non-zero. So we'll have a d of k minus a k magnitude squared plus from minus infinity to minus m over 2 minus 1 a d of k magnitude squared and then a region of k above m over 2. And at this point it becomes almost trivial to identify the solution to this optimization problem, and that is we're going to choose a of k so that this magnitude squared term goes 0 by setting a of k equal to a d of k. So that's what we do. We set a of k equal to a d of k on the range minus m over 2 to m over 2. And this is, can be viewed equivalently to obtaining a d of k, which in general is going to go from k equals minus infinity to infinity, and multiplying by a window w of k. Recall, to get a d of k, we're going to take the inverse discrete time Fourier transform of our desired response. In other words, the impulse response associated with that real valued filter frequency response. And we know that this minimizes the average squared error between a d and a of omega. The squared error is on average over the entire interval. And there may be some frequencies where the absolute error, or just this difference, is quite large, yet it contributes a small amount to the mean squared error. Looking at our expression for a of k in terms of the product of a d of k and a window function w of k, we can write a of omega, our actual response, is given by the desired response convolved with the window function. In this case, for the rectangular window that minimizes the mean squared error, we know that the rectangular window has a discrete time Fourier transform W of E of J omega, which is characterized by a main lobe having width 4 pi divided by m plus 1. And then there are these oscillations in the side lobes. The largest side lobe is down 13 dB relative to the main lobe. 
when I convolve this window function with the desired response, for example, an ideal low pass filter is going to blur the edges here, and then there's going to be oscillations as well. Recall that when we do convolution, we take this function, we flip it and shift it, and then as we shift it, we calculate the error under the product of AD of omega and W of e to J omega. Well, as this function shifts along, the area under that product changes because side lobes are going in and out of these edges at the filter, and that causes oscillation or ripple. So our response that we obtain looks something like this. We've blurred the transition from a perfectly vertical line and now it's horizontal and this is going to have something to do with the main lobe width because we get the transition in from the convolution when the main lobe goes through this edge. And then we have these oscillations at the edge of the pass band and as we get into the stop band that are associated with the side lobes going through these edges and the change in area under the product. So the main lobe width for W has a big effect on the transition bandwidth, while the side lobes of W affect the pass band and the stop band ripple. Most of the time, the minus 13 dB side lobes of the rectangular window lead to an unacceptable level of ripple in both the pass band and the stop band. We typically use other windows than the rectangular window to trade main lobe width, that is the transition band, for side lobes, in other words, lower ripple. Now there's quite a few different windows, and there's something like 15 or 16 in MATLAB alone. One of those, I'll illustrate here, is the Hamming window, which is easy to write down. It's basically a raised cosine on a small pedestal. So it's 0.54 minus 0.46 cosine 2 pi k plus m over 2 for k between minus m over 2 and plus m over 2. The main lobe width of this window is 8 pi over m. Remember the rectangular window main lobe width was 4 pi over m plus 1. So this is on the order of twice as wide of a main lobe, but the peak side lobe height is minus 41 dB. And you can see that in this graph down here where I've depicted the width of the main lobe and the side lobe heights for a rectangular window with m equal 24 and a Hamming window in the green for m equal 24. The main lobe width of the Hamming window is twice as wide as that of the rectangular window. And then the side lobes are quite a bit lower. The first side lobe here is minus 13 dB for the rectangular window. And then the Hamming window is something like minus 41 dB. Here's an example using a low pass filter where the cutoff of this filter was at 0.5 in normalized frequency. And you can see that the rectangular window has these strong oscillations in the pass band associated with the changes in area as the side lobes slide through the edge of the pass band when we're computing the convolution. And then it also has a ripple in the stop band. It's hard to say on the linear scale in the dB scale that this provides a maximum stop band attenuation of 20 dB. In contrast, when we use a Hamming window, we see virtually no ripple in the pass band and very little ripple in the stop band at the expense of a wider transition band. Side lobes in the Hamming window case are down on the order of minus 55 dB. With all the different windows that are available, there's really no clear formulas or way to optimize the design of these filters, although the one that comes closest is the so-called Kaiser window. And this is chosen, the Kaiser window, to approximately optimize the trade-off between the main lobe width or the transition band of the filter and side lobe height, which leads to ripple in both the pass band and the stop band. The Kaiser window has two parameters, beta and the order parameter m that we get to choose and it's defined in terms of the zeroth order modified Bessel function of the first kind. And this can be computed relatively easily with software such as MATLAB, and you can see that the parameter beta enters in here as well as the order. Now as beta changes, we get different windows. When beta is equal to zero, we obtain a rectangular window. As beta increases, the main lobe width increases and the side lobe height starts to decrease. As we call the rectangular window is gonna have the narrowest main lobe and the highest side lobes. Now it turns out there's some empirical formulas for choosing beta with this window. 
if one desires a certain maximum error in dB, and we'll call that alpha and assume that that's a positive quantity. So if we need side lobes at minus 40 dB, or a gain in the linear scale of 0.01, then alpha would be 40. And so depending on whether alpha is greater than 50, between 21 and 50, and less than 21, we get different formulas here for choosing beta. Similarly, we can choose the filter order knowing alpha with another empirical formula where delta omega is the transition bandwidth. So we'll illustrate this with an example of a bandpass filter design. And let's suppose we have specifications indicated by this tolerance diagram that says in the pass band we want the gain to be nominally 1 with an error less than 0.05, while in the two stop bands we want the gain to be less than 0.01. Now in this particular filter, I'm assuming that the lower stop band goes from 0 to pi over 5, then the pass band goes from 2 pi over 5 to 3 pi over 5. So here we have a transition bandwidth of pi over 5. On the upper side, we'll assume that the stop band starts at 7 pi over 10 and goes to pi. So this design procedure, because we're convolving a window with our ideal frequency response function, the window is going to have the same main lobe width no matter where we are in the frequency domain. So the transition bandwidth, which is defined by the main lobe width, we're going to have to choose based on the smallest band which would be pi over 10. And similarly, we can't differentially control the ripple in the pass band and the stop band because the ripple is solely due to the side lobes of the window. So we're going to have to choose the most conservative error, which in this particular example would be 0.01, to define the side lobes. So using MATLAB, which has the Kaiser window and a handy command called Kaiser ORD, which chooses the parameters of the Kaiser window for you based on the specification we're going to lay out our pass bands and our stop bands here in the vector f. f for the Kaiser window, MATLAB assumes that the starting frequency is 0. So the stop first band goes from 0 to pi over 5, and that's a stop band, so we're going to put the amplitude for that band to be 0. Then the next band goes from 2 pi over 5 to 3 pi over 5, and that's a pass band, so we're going to have the amplitude for that band to be equal to 1. And then the last band, starts at 7 pi over 10, and MATLAB assumes it ends at pi. 7 pi over 10 here is specified in the vector f, and we'll have the gain in that band be 0. And again, MATLAB uses normalized frequencies, so we need to divide these values by pi. We then also specify the ripple in each of these bands. So in the lower stop band, we have a ripple of 0 0.01 that we require. In the pass band, a ripple of 0 0.05 is allowable and in the upper stop band, a ripple of 0 0.01. We apply these parameters to the Kaiser order command, and we get that the order should be m equals 45, and we also get expression for beta from the previous slide, which comes out to 3.3953, and these parameters end up being chosen based on a transition band of pi over 10 and a ripple of 0 0.01. And we can find the FIR filter with the window method and the Kaiser window parameters by using the FIR1 command. Here I'm showing the results. We've got the impulse response. And if we look at the magnitude response of this particular filter, we see that indeed the gain is less than minus 40 dB in the stop bands, and our ripple tolerance was 0 0.01, which is minus 40 dB and our stop band here is 0.2 in normalized frequency. And then on the upper stop band started at 7 pi over 10 or 0.7 in normalized frequency. So here's the edge of our stop band and you can see that we clearly are satisfying the constraint. The transition band is actually only pi over 10 wide because our, our pass band goes from 0.4 pi to 0.6 pi and thus we get a bit wider in the lower edge where we had a pi over 5 transition bandwidth. We're actually not using all that. We're only using about pi over 10. So there's complete symmetry in the response here. Plotting the error on a linear scale here, the absolute error in the pass band from 0.4 to 0.6 normalized frequency, the error is also below 0.01 in the pass band. And 
and that's because the ripple in the window, which determines the errors in the stop band and the pass band, is the same. So we get a maximum ripple here of less than 0 0.01, and that clearly satisfies the specifications. So with the Kaiser window, it's possible to do a fairly systematic design procedure using the window method. With other windows, it's more difficult to do a systematic approach, and methods like the Minimax approach are a bit easier to use, although they're computationally much more challenging to implement. One of the things that you have with the Minimax approach is that you can arbitrarily allow the ripple to be different in different bands, as well as have different transition bandwidths. Whereas with the window method, you're going to choose the side lobes of the window, as well as its main lobe width, based on the most conservative of your specifications.